What on earth is this problem? The point is somehow rotating. Huh? Wait! Whoa! Help me! Wah! Where am I? Welcome to the world of the spiral. Medan, what are you doing here? I'm merely your guide. Does this spiral have anything to do with that earlier problem? Well, something like that. Now then, shall we get to the main topic? In this world, the layers continue infinitely up and down. They go on forever? What are you even talking about? And in fact, each layer also extends infinitely in the horizontal direction. What do you mean? Why would anyone think of such a strange space? Very well, allow me to explain. Normally when a coin on a plane goes around once, it returns to its original position. Yeah, that's true. But what if going around once took it to another world? What? That's impossible. I don't blame you for thinking that. But suppose such a world did exist? What kind of shape would it have? No way! Okay, that is exactly this space. Let's call this the spiral-shaped space for now. Apparently, this space hides a certain secret. And I want you to uncover that. So with that, I'll leave the rest to you. Wait, hold on. What do you mean, secret? Try to think for yourself a little. Though, I suppose giving no hints at all would be too harsh. This diagram is only meant to be intuitive. So let's try to describe the idea of moving to another world after one full turn in a more mathematical way. The key to this story is coordinates. Coordinates? When you say coordinates, you mean something like this, right? There are two perpendicular axes and a point located by moving x along the x-axis and then y along the y-axis from the origin is represented by the coordinates x, y. Exactly. This coordinate system is called the Cartesian coordinate system. The point on the plane is represented as a pair of numbers along two perpendicular axes. Now, let's draw a vector from the origin to that point. This vector indicates the position of the point. So that means we can also think of a point as a vector, right? That's exactly right. But what does this have to do with that weird space? Well now, no need to rush. Besides Cartesian coordinates, have you heard of something called polar coordinates? I think I might have heard of that somewhere. Polar coordinates also describe a point's position, but the concept is different from Cartesian coordinates. Here we define r as the length of the vector, that is the distance from the origin, and theta as the angle it makes with the positive x-axis. Then the position of a point on a plane can be expressed using r and theta. This vector or point can be written as r angle theta. Hmm, I see. Using this? This point located r away from the origin can be written as r angle 0 degrees. Because the angle it makes with the x-axis is 0 degrees. And if we rotate it 360 degrees, it becomes r angle 360 degrees. These two represent the same point on the plane, but what if they were different points? Wait, is it even okay to think like that? How fascinating! Let's use a little trick here. A trick? That means we treat r angle theta as an ordered pair of r and theta. As a pair, I get it. Then we can treat r angle 0 degrees and r angle 360 degrees as different. Because 0 and 360 are different numbers, these two are different pairs. But somehow, it feels like I'm being tricked. I understand how you feel. But for now, let's keep moving forward. So, the entire set of r angle theta points can be visualized as the spiral shaped space. Here, r represents the distance from the vertical axis and theta represents the angle of rotation around that axis. For example, if you start at the point 4 angle 0 degrees and make one full turn, you arrive at a different point, 4 angle 360 degrees. Also, 8 angle 390 degrees lies a bit further around the spiral and it's even farther from the axis. So that's the kind of structure this space has. By the way, since r is a positive real number, each layer actually extends infinitely in the horizontal direction. Whoa, really? And since theta can be any real number, the layers go on infinitely up and down. This is kind of mysterious. Going around once takes you somewhere else. In a way, that feels kind of liberating. But in exchange for that freedom, this space has lost something important. And that is addition. Wh what did you say? Addition is gone? What does that even mean? In fact, addition doesn't exist in this space. In other words, we can't extend addition into the spiral-shaped space. Really? That's kind of hard to believe. We're talking about vector addition here, right? You can connect two vectors to create a new vector. That's what vector addition is. That's true. Vector addition naturally assumes a flat, linear space. 
It ignores how many times you've looped around. Therefore, we can't extend addition into the spiral-shaped space. I kind of get it, kind of don't. Is that really true? Very well. If you're doubtful, let's assume that addition is possible in this space. We will start with the vector 1 angle 0 degrees, and move 360 degrees from there. Then we arrive at the vector 1 angle 360 degrees. So what happens if we add these two vectors together? Hmm, I wonder what happens. Adding two vectors in this space? It's a bit hard, so let's flatten them onto a single plane for now. Then both of them become vectors like this, each with length 1. And if we add this vector to itself, we get a vector of length 2. No issue so far. Yeah. Now we just need to bring it back into the spiral shaped space. There are many corresponding vectors in the spiral shaped space, but since we're adding vectors at 0 degrees and 360 degrees, it feels safe to narrow the angle down to either 0 degrees or 360 degrees. If we go with the midpoint, 180 degrees, the vector would point the opposite way. So 180 degrees is clearly not a candidate. So now we have two candidates, but which one is really the correct answer? What an interesting situation. Now, which of the two is the right result for vector addition? To figure that out, let's first assume the answer is the one at zero degrees. So that means we're assuming one angle zero degrees plus one angle 360 degrees equals two angle zero degrees. This feels kind of strange. On the left we have 0 degrees and 360 degrees, but on the right it's just 0 degrees. I can't quite explain it, but something feels off. You're right to feel that way. If we add 1 angle 0 degrees to itself, then naturally the result should be 2 angle 0 degrees. Hmm, adding the same vector means its length becomes twice as long. But something very strange is happening here. Huh? What do you mean? Look closely, Zanaman. In these two equations, this part is the only thing that differs. And what that means is, we're adding different vectors to the same vector, yet the result ends up being the same. That kind of thing would never happen with the usual vector addition. You're right. That means the assumption must have been wrong. So the other one must be the real answer? The other one being 360 degrees, of course. So now we're assuming that 1 angle 0 degrees plus 1 angle 360 degrees equals 2 angle 360 degrees. But again, if we add 1 angle 360 degrees to itself, we also get 2 angle 360 degrees. So once again, we're adding different vectors to the same vector, but the result turns out the same. This means... In spiral shaped space, addition can't be naturally defined. Not being able to add, that's too great a sacrifice. You're right, it is a big sacrifice, but there's something else we can do instead of addition. And that is... What is it? Multiplication. Multiplication? Sounds harder than addition. Um, so how do we do multiplication? To define multiplication in this space, we need a very powerful tool. Tell me already. Now now, no need to rush. That tool is called the complex numbers. Complex numbers? Why are they showing up here? I get why you're confused, but just keep going and it will all make sense. Now then, let's use complex numbers to define multiplication in that spiral-shaped space. A complex number is a number expressed in the form x plus i y where x and y are real numbers. Here, i is the number whose square is negative 1, and it's called the imaginary unit. Okay, I'm good with this part so far. We can associate any complex number z equals x plus i y, with a point whose x-coordinate is x, and y-coordinate is y. That way, points on the plane can be identified with complex numbers. This plane made up of complex numbers is called the complex plane. Ah, oh, I see. That makes sense. So this is a Cartesian way of thinking? That makes me want to think in terms of polar coordinates next. You're really sharp today, Sandaman. Yes, if we want to handle polar coordinates using complex numbers, there's a very important formula involved. On the complex plane, let's draw a circle centered at the origin with radius 1. That's what we call the unit circle. Then we place the point C equals X plus I Y on the circle. And let data be the angle that this vector makes with the real axis, that is the X axis. Now, how can we express the real part X and imaginary part Y using theta? Um, X is given by cosine of theta, and Y is given by sine of theta. That sounds correct. So z equals x plus i y can be written as cosine of theta plus i sine of theta. Now we will use Euler's formula. Euler's formula is a relationship in the world of complex numbers that links exponential and trigonometric functions. 
It tells us that the real part of e to the i theta is cosine of theta, and the imaginary part is sine of theta. Here, e is Euler's number, a constant approximately equal to 2.718. Also from now on we'll use radians for angles, meaning 1 full turn is 2 pi. This is kind of hard. Well simply put, the expression we had before matches the form of Euler's formula. That means using complex exponentials, we can write c as e to the i theta. To summarize, a point C on the unit circle can be expressed as E to the I theta using the angle theta. It's so strange that E to an imaginary power moves around the unit circle. But I feel like I'm starting to see how this connects to the spiral shake space. Exactly. Let's go even further. E to the I theta always has length 1. But by changing theta, you can freely change its direction. So, e to the i theta is like a vector that sets the direction. If we multiply it by a real number r, then r gives the length and theta gives the direction. That means we can represent any complex number. Yes, this is called the polar form of a complex number. So the point we previously wrote as r angle theta corresponds to the complex number r e to the i theta. That makes sense feel a lot clearer. By the way, what's this actually useful for? Let me explain. A point in polar coordinates can be expressed using a simple complex number. Which means, you can multiply points expressed in polar coordinates. We can multiply them! Oh, now that you mention it, I wanna try it right now! Let's take two complex numbers and polar form, r sub 1 e to the i theta sub 1, and r sub 2 e to the i theta sub 2, and try multiplying them. First, let's group the lengths of the vectors r sub 1 and r sub 2 together. That gives us something like this. Now since we're multiplying powers, we can add the exponents together. For now, let's go ahead and assume that this still works for imaginary exponents. Yes! Then we can factor out the common i. This is turning out to be really interesting! Summing it all up, we get this nice equation. Well done, Zandeman! Now let's extract the lengths and angles of the vectors and express them as ordered pairs. Extracting the lengths and angles? Yeah! This makes sense. Then you'll notice the lengths are multiplied, and the angles are added. Also, by writing the polar form as a pair of length and angle, the angle is no longer limited to a single rotation. It can take any value freely. With this in mind, if we represent a complex number in polar form as a pair, or theta, we can imagine a world where theta isn't restricted, an extended version of the complex plane. This is a type of structure called a Riemann surface. Roughly speaking, a Riemann surface locally behaves like the complex plane. From now on, when we say Riemann surface, we'll be referring to this one. So that spiral shake space was actually a kind of Riemann surface. This model is drawn as embedded in three-dimensional space, but more accurately, it's a two-dimensional surface. Just keep in mind, this is a simplified method that begins with polar coordinates. Now let's try performing multiplication on this Riemann surface. This is an example of multiplying complex numbers in polar form, but we can also interpret it as multiplication on the Riemann surface. Technically, it's an abusive notation to write them like complex numbers, but it's intuitive, so we'll go with it for now. At first glance, this just looks like regular complex multiplication. Time to think about it using the Riemann surface. We'll refer to this point as 1, with angle 0. Then these two points are located around here, and the product is shown as this resulting point. On a flat plane, this result would be indistinguishable from 1. But on the Riemann surface, it's clearly different. So keep that in mind. So this is what multiplication looks like. That's kinda cool. Hmm, but still, why can't we do addition on this Riemann surface? We can define multiplication, but not addition. That just doesn't make sense to me. Sundamon, look out! A hint is coming. What? Whoa, what is that? E to the power of Z. Wait, just to be sure, this really is the hint, right? It seems like it is. If we keep going, we might learn something about the mystery of addition too. Okay. Well, I guess I'll try calculating it anyway. Let's assume z is a complex number. If we take the complex number z equals x plus i y and calculate e to the z, we get this result. That's truly fascinating. You can already see the polar form r e to the i theta emerging from this. Huh? Really? So polar form shows up here too? But remember, since r equals e to the x is always positive, the origin is excluded. For a complex number z, e to the z naturally takes the polar form. 
It's amazing how deeply connected the exponential function and the polar form are. Complex numbers are truly deep. So to summarize, the real part x corresponds to the vector's length e to the x. On the other hand, the imaginary part becomes the angle itself. Surprising but it's a simple and elegant connection. Now what would this look like as a diagram? A diagram, huh? You mean visualizing the complex exponential function? Yes. Let's use the exponential function to map partition coordinates into a kind of polar coordinates. X stands for the exponential function. Note that the origin is excluded in the diagram on the right. Got it. Alright, let's start from the origin in the Cartesian coordinates. If we change the real part in Cartesian coordinates, the vector's length changes in polar coordinates. And if we move the imaginary part, the angle of the vector changes. If we increase the imaginary part enough, the point loops all the way around and returns to the same spot. Yes, yes, you're getting it. It's a nice mapping, but the rotation causes points to overlap. So there's redundancy in the correspondence. To eliminate that redundancy, we use the Riemann surface. Just like the origin was excluded before, the vertical axis is excluded from the Riemann surface too. Understood. Let's try changing the values just like before. When the real part changes in Cartesian coordinates, the vector's length changes on the Riemann surface. And when the imaginary part changes, the vector's angle changes on the Riemann surface. Up to this point it's the same, but, no matter how much we increase the imaginary part, the vector never loops back to its original spot on the Riemann surface. The Riemann surface extends infinitely up and down. It feels like we're getting to the heart of it. Now, let's take addition from the world on the left and map it into the world on the right using the exponential function. We'll skip the proof, but this equation still holds here too. Wait a minute. Does that mean addition in the left world becomes multiplication in the right world through the exponential function? The right world has multiplication, but why not addition? Actually, the question itself is a bit off. Multiplication in the right world is really just addition from the left world. So that's what it was all along. If we call the reverse of this mapping log, then log becomes a function from the Riemann surface to the complex plane. The surface we've been calling just the Riemann surface is more precisely the Riemann surface of the logarithm. This surface allows us to define the complex logarithm in a more natural way. If you're curious about the approach that starts from the logarithmic function, we've explained it in another video. Check it out! Well then, take care everyone! See you later!